School's out, the children play. In city parks, in the rain barrel, behind the cow shed on the farm. There are now about 16 million people in Canada, and the population is increasing faster than that of any country in the Western world. Most of them live in cities and towns, busy with all the serious occupations of modern life. Some work with their hands, with others it's head work. something different to every Canadian. To some, it is the smell of pine wood and the ring of saws. For much of Canada is forest. To some, it is the clamor of gulls three oceans border it, or the feel of ripened grain in the heat of August on the spreading prairie under an open sky. To some it is hard riding and the smell of saddle leather. The rocky Northland, formed before the dawn of life on Earth, with its million cold, clear lakes. To some it is working together in green fields, the bloom of ripe grapes, and all the fruits of sun and air and earth at harvest time. In all Canadians, there is a feeling of closeness to their land, though few come to know all of it, because it is so varied and so vast. The Canada stretches from the Atlantic Ocean in the east to the Pacific Ocean in the west, and north almost to the pole. It reaches a quarter of the way around the clock. When it's lunchtime in Vancouver, it is already supper time in St. John's. A land area greater than the whole of Europe. Larger even than its great neighbor to the south. But in all this space, there are only four people to every square mile. And most of them live along the southern border. To get to know them as a people, you need to know something of their background and the influences that have made them what they are. If you find yourself in a Quebec village, the language you hear will almost certainly be French, for about a third of the Canadians are French in origin. Their motto, je me souviens, I remember. They remember that the first settlements were hacked out of the wilderness by their ancestors. They remember too the invading fleet of the English lying off Quebec two centuries ago as European wars spread to the shores of the outlying French colony. 
They remember the night the English troops scaled the cliff thought impregnable, and the final decisive battle in the dawn, when the little colony passed into English hands. For them, cut off from a France plunging toward violence and revolution, the war was over. They remember that after the havoc of war, there was a generous peace. They retained the right to their own language, religion, civil law, freedom to build their lives in their own peaceful way. A peaceful life, but a rugged one like that of all the Canadian pioneers. Even today in the back country, we can see the hardships they faced. Endless toil to wrest from a stubborn land the dream of all settlers. The wilderness become fruitful. But they have flourished. Out of the wilderness, great cities have grown. Montreal, after Paris, is the largest French-speaking city in the world. And in nine of the ten Canadian provinces, there are now French-speaking settlements. The second major influence is the British, both in origin and tradition. At the formal opening of Parliament each year, the pomp and ceremony are modelled on those of Westminster. For almost a century now, Canada has been self-governing, an evolution to independence which set the pattern whereby the old British Empire has been transformed into the larger Commonwealth. Canada has chosen to adopt the British parliamentary system of government, but it is a parliament that speaks two official languages, English and French. Freely elected members express the will and temper of the nation. Each new member is formally introduced to the dignity of the house. Mr. Speaker, I have the honor to introduce to you the Honorable Lester Bowles Pearson, member-elect for the Electoral District of Algoma East, who has taken the oath, signed the roll, and now claims the right to take his seat. The Honorable Member may take his seat. British in some traditions, yes, but the English they speak sounds more like New York than London, for Canada is a North American nation. There are many connections between the United States and Canada. The interchange of tourists, businessmen, goods, ideas. In fact, Americans who visit Canada see a country similar in many ways to home. The financial world is closely linked with that of the United States. American and other capital is helping to develop Canada's rapidly expanding industry. Canadian industry itself closely parallels that of the states. The labor unions are built on the American pattern, like the cars that roll off the assembly lines. There is also a deeper and less tangible similarity. To Canadians, American news services, movies, radio and television programs, and other media are as familiar as their own backyard. And though Canadians wouldn't thank you to be confused with their neighbors, their understanding of American ways is as friends or relatives instead of strangers. The Canadian character is also continually leavened by waves of immigrants from many other cultures. Hannah Kratz from Czechoslovakia, doctor in a northern outpost. The Furches, Kazakhs, Fischls, who have brought new industries. 
Yusuf Karsh, portrait photographer. Armenian, Ukrainian, Norwegian, Dutch, millions of Canadians have their roots in the cultures of continental Europe. This kinship is one reason why it's not strange to find stationed in Europe Canadian forces contributing to the strength of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. It was Canada, in fact, that first suggested concrete plans for the Atlantic Alliance. Now, with the people of their ancestral homelands, the Canadians are making common cause to safeguard what is finally a common and shared inheritance. It's not strange that the mayor of Caen in France should welcome Canadian soldiers, for the task of rebuilding and strengthening the West is a shared one. In Canada itself, airmen from NATO countries have been trained, prepared to defend, if necessary, the common heritage of them all. This common desire for peace finds dramatic expression in the Canadian Arctic. Until recently, except for some isolated settlements, a few thousand Eskimos and Indians were the sole inhabitants of an area half the size of Europe. Now is a time of change. It's not worth a single soldier to defend all those acres of snow. This was the sneer of Voltaire when Canada was a little French colony. Today, Canadians obviously feel differently. Hardy men are moving into the subarctic. Mysterious domes punctuate the landscape, part of a triple aerial defense line, a line which has brought the gear of ultra-modern technology to girdle the north. For the Canadian Arctic is a flank of defense for the whole Atlantic community. To Canadians, Arctic life presents other challenges, especially the weather. Of course, there are those who claim they thrive on it. Traders, trappers, missionaries, prospectors, the ubiquitous Mounties, they all say, the North gets you. It can't be too bad. The Eskimos, who have lived there for centuries, are reputed to be the happiest people on Earth. In general, wherever they live, winter doesn't seem to stop Canadians. Canadians find their country demands boldness. It's a land for engineers, a land of great projects, like the development of iron mines in Ungava, like Kitimat in the West Coast Mountains. At Kitimat, with the help of an airlift, Canadians have planted immense aluminum smelters in virgin wilderness.
For the St. Lawrence Seaway, a model of the river has been studied to guide the builders of an ocean vessel route reaching 2,000 miles into the continent. A pipeline to carry fuel from the oil fields of the west to the hungry industries of the east. For Canada is using more and more power. Atomic research in industry and medicine. It was with Cobalt 60 made at Chalk River that Canada's famous beam therapy unit was developed to use the immense power of nuclear forces for healing for the service of man. In Montreal, students from all over the world observe the work of Wilder Penfield, neurologist, eminent for his understanding of some of the mysteries of the human mind and for his skill as a brain surgeon. Canadians sense perhaps their biggest challenge in the realm of the mind. They feel that in its ideals and purposes, their country is not as yet fully formed. It's still too young to expect that. Yet there is emerging a deep sense of the new nation, and they feel a growing confidence that they will be able to express that sense in art and thought. All this growing out of their experience and understanding of the many faceted nation in which they live, with all its sights and sounds. plenty of elbow room, but a country also which is taking up with vigor the challenge of the 20th century. 